So let's talk through uh, the front pages as well as some of the stories inside tomorrow morning's newspapers and now with uh, Liz Barkley and Adam Klein. So let's move on to the front page of the Times now. Um, you've picked out a story about um, Hillary. Yes, can I say that? Oh, it's small. You've got very good eyes. It's right down there. There we go. Hillary set to run. It's not, room so, room. not so much of a story, I don't think, as, it, yes, as the room of metal. Um, Hillary has declared publicly that she wants to see a woman as US president. And who else could it possibly be? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what the story amounts to at this point in time. We haven't seen page 28. That's it, because we haven't had the inside pages, pages and that's she's all it's based on that she's preparing, you know, they're saying that this is the clearest indication yet that she is preparing to run for the presidency. And of course this is, you know, people have been asking this question for probably the best part of eight years now. Yeah. And of course she did come very close, didn't and she? she did come, she was just she beaten did. by President yes, Obama to did. the um, candidacy. But who else could that woman be? Can you think of anybody else? Any other names you'd like to throw on the board? It's the story, you know, who knows if this is kind of part of a longer term strategy for her to kind of... Do you think this is a PR spin? It could be. It could be. It could be. Watch his face. Uh, truth behind Britain's out-of-hours justice system. Uh, what's this all about? Well, this is the Court of Protection, and they're facing questions about transparency. We've been talking about transparency earlier on in the mm -hmm. NHS and police service, and here's another uh, instance where it seems that people are questioning whether or not judges are making life-and-death decisions over the phone with incomplete evidence uh, in proceedings that are not always recorded and therefore we don't always get to hear about. Now the Court of Protection is the court that makes welfare decisions on behalf of people who are deemed to be perhaps mentally incapable of making their own decisions. Um, so written evidence is rarely used it seems in these out of hours cases because the court will be called upon uh, out of hours if the decision has to be made in the interests of a vulnerable person. So it's, it's, it's just this issue as to whether or not these phone calls with, with perhaps one barrister are enough in order to base a decision and why they're not being recorded and why we don't know. So there's, an ins there's a, a couple of examples given here. In one case, a judge allowed an Asian woman with learning dis uh, difficulties to be seized from her home on the basis of flimsy evidence that she was about to be married off and that led to... Uh, damages settlement against uh, uh, the council and in another case a man with mental health problems who took a drug overdose was allowed to die following a late night decision that was never recorded so there there are calls by John Hemming MP he's saying that this is uh, the, the use of these hearings is appalling he's accusing ministers of complacency and failing to investigate the practice and legal experts are saying you know we need this, uh, we need these cases investigated because if they had come to court, then they could have been much more rigorously investigated and defended in a court situation. Um, I was checking up uh, some of the statistics around Wimbledon today. £16 million pounds in prize money, uh, thereabouts, this year. Uh, they expect to make uh, around about £31 million pounds in um, surplus profits, which goes to the Lawn Tennis Association, which is all for the development of yep. tennis in the UK. So. You know, we can hope, uh, hopefully, there might be a few more champions in the pipeline with that kind of money yeah. to spend. But I think that there's been about 500 million spent since 1994, and we haven't come up with too many yet. No. And I mean, cover a police officer who says that he was sent by the Met to smear the relations and friends of uh, Stephen Lawrence. It defies belief. It is absolutely incredible. Mm. For four years, apparently, this officer was sent to look for any dirt, as he, as it's described in inverted commas uh, by The Guardian, that he could against members of the Lawrence family in that period shortly after uh, Stephen Lawrence's murder. And as Stephen Lawrence's mother, Doreen, says, you know, nothing can justify the whole thing about trying to discredit the family and the people around us. And of course, she's also said that out of all the things she's found out over the years, this has, this has topped it. Mm -hmm. I'm not surprised. It's, it's incredible. But, and, but that in itself, I mean, given the number of things that came out to yep. do with that police investigation, the fact this is one of the most surprising to her. But she was also seen. looking to discredit the friend who had seen the stabbing um, and the people who were campaigning for a better investigation into the murder. I find this extremely disturbing. Um, he also describes being involved in an ultimately failed effort to discredit uh, Dwayne Brooks, who was a close friend of Stephen Morris's, who was with him on the night that he was killed and was the main witness to the murder. 
Um, and the former spy found evidence that led to Brooks being arrested and charged in October 1993, before the case was thrown out by a judge. Mm -hmm. So, what evidence was found, and why was it thrown out by a judge? I mean, I, I assume it's all on record. Yeah. Um, but that's horrendous, because that could have led to uh, a miscarriage of justice. Work-related costs take a fifth of income. Uh, but yes, this is, this is research that has shown that a fifth of our earnings go on things like commuting, food, office whip rounds, work clothes, you know, fuel, train fares, all that kind of stuff, tea and coffees. Uh, cut out some of those coffees and perhaps we'll save a bit. They add up to about £236 a month and with the average take-home pay at 1543 a month, that means that a fifth of our money goes on work-related costs. So those costs are going up as well as all our bills going up. It's hardly surprising that a lot of people find it very difficult to make that average take-home pay stretch. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's, it's, about, it's about the people who are working uh, being stretched as well as the people who are, yeah. you know, are dependent on welfare benefits. And how charity shops make us even more likely to give? Well, it's having the charity shop there, it's seeing it and it's thinking about, uh, you know, when you walk past it and you think, and you see all those posters that say children don't have clean water or whatever it happens to be, it does make you stop and think, I think, that perhaps you could do that a little bit more. There was research out about three weeks ago which interestingly showed that we would give twice as much to charity if, we, if, while we were making a will, a lawyer simply suggested to us that we might like to give something to charity. So it is all about us not thinking about it. If you don't stop, if you don't see it, then you're less likely to it's, yeah, it's also interesting how the big charities have become much more professional about their retail outlets. Yeah. So Oxfam, for instance, brought in uh, the woman who used to uh, run Topshop right. um, in order to give it a much, much more professional front and, and that really did wonders for their income. So, you know, they are professionalising because they are in competition with other yes. retailers. Well, on that happy note, we will leave it. But Adam Clyde and Liz Barclay, thanks so much for sharing your stories with us. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.